According to a 2017 report from Amnesty International, 23% of women have experienced online abuse or harassment at least once. 41% of these said that on at least one occasion, online harassment made them fear that their physical safety was threatened. Another 2017 survey by the Pew Research Center in the United States revealed that while men experience slightly more online harassment, such as name-calling or physical threats, women are much more likely to experience severe types of gender-based or sexual harassment. We call this misogyny, hateful content targeting women. In Denmark, where we're based, 68% of social media users say that they refrain from participating in online debates because the tone is too harsh, and that number has been increasing over the last five years. Around 15% of hateful content online is gender targeted. Human moderators of online abuse have shown to develop severe anxiety and even PTSD when they are exposed to hateful language for hours and hours every day. So we need automatic systems for detecting and moderating abusive language online. If you think of general online hate speech, misogyny covers a pretty large group of people about 50% of the population, to be specific. Misogyny is not just sexual harassment. It's an extremely linguistically diverse phenomenon which includes belittling women, aggression towards women, and discrimination against women. To detect misogyny online, you need three things. You need to know what you're trying to detect, you need to have examples of those things, and you need a model trained on those examples. The first we achieve by creating an accurate labeling scheme, a taxonomy, which categorizes different forms of misogyny. The second we present as a dataset of 2,000 carefully labeled instances of misogyny from a total dataset of almost 30,000 social media posts. The third, our model, performs so well that it can already automatically detect 85% of not before seen misogynistic content. When we started, there were only two non-English datasets that we knew of, one in Spanish and one in Italian, and a very few taxonomies for labeling types of misogyny. In existing data, it's clear that there are cultural or language-specific differences between which type of misogyny is more widespread. For example, Spanish shows a stronger presence of dominance, Italian of stereotyping and objectification, and English of discrediting. This was the initial observation that made us consider the importance of local context. We created a taxonomy for misogyny, a labeling scheme to define different types of misogyny in the data. This taxonomy is the product of existing research in online abusive language and misogyny, a review of misogyny in the context of online platforms in Denmark, and iterative adjustments during the process. During the research of the Danish context specifically, we became aware of the term neosexism, the belief that women have already achieved equality and that discrimination of women does not exist. Neosexism is seen in cases where people deny the existence of discrimination or use straw man arguments to avoid the topic. For instance, an example from the data, please show me research that shows women miss out on promotions because they take maternity leave. Or, classic, if a woman has a problem, society is to blame. If a man has a problem, it is his own fault. Sexism thrives among feminists. Now we have the labeling scheme, and it's time to find examples with which to train the model. To create a representative dataset for Danish, we looked at where Danes are present online. That means that the dataset is sampled from Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. These are the most popular text-centric social media platforms in Denmark. In annotating our dataset, we built on the Meta Framework by Pustyovsky and Stabs and used the Finlayson and Aryabet's variation, where the train and test stages are replaced by leveraging of annotations towards representativeness instead of prediction performance. We took extremely careful measures to identify and mitigate biases in the annotation process. For example, we recruited annotators with a mix of genders, ages, occupations, and linguistic dialects. We also recruited a facilitator with a background in ethnography to lead the annotation discussions. During the whole research period of three months, there were weekly discussions where doubts and edge cases could be discussed among all annotators. 
Clarifications were added to the codebook and labeling scheme after every discussion to create and document a common understanding. We reached a 0.71 annotator agreement and a flyscapper of around 0.5 across the subtasks. The final dataset contains 27.9 thousand comments, of which 7.500 contain abusive language. Misogynistic posts comprise 7% of overall posts or about 2,000 instances. Neosexism is by far the most frequently represented class with 1.3 thousand tag posts. This indicates that the most prevalent misogynistic strategy in the sampled online discourse is to deny the existence of anti-female sexism or bias. Discrediting, stereotyping and objectification are present in about 300 and 200 posts. Benevolent misogyny, dominance and harassment are tagged in between only 45 and 70 posts. We fine-tuned an MBERT model over this dataset using an 80-20 train test split. Model performance was good, especially considering that this is a new task and one in the difficult, abusive language domain. Our model detects five out of every six misogynistic messages. The model can also correctly identify the type of misogyny, such as stereotyping or harassment, 79% of the time. This is a great state-of-the-art result for detecting abusive content. So now we have a taxonomy for labeling misogyny, we have a data set of examples of misogyny in Danish, and we have a model which can accurately detect misogyny in 85% of cases. The model has been implemented and is available on request, like the data. The full version of the collaboratively developed annotation guidelines is released, and we encourage its use in other languages and contexts. At each step, we've worked to identify biases, selection bias, label bias, and annotator biases. This means that the data and results are as objective as one could reasonably expect. And this objectivity is reflected both in our intrinsic annotation quality measures and in how well the machine learning model learned the functions of detecting and categorizing misogyny. Our hope is to continue to see transparent approaches to tackling abusive language that integrate sociological, linguistic and computational aspects. So we can have more high-quality datasets that let us learn about misogynistic behavior while minimizing human contact with this form of toxicity.